You're watching The Sports Objective, the podcast for pirates. You're listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on The Sports Objective. Join Coach C, a USA Strength and Conditioning Hall of Famer, every Monday night to see in a variety of guests, including former players, former and current coaches, pastors, and others will discuss relevant issues in coaching today's athlete with the goal of equipping the athlete and those coaching them with the physical, mental, and spiritual armor necessary to live their best life. Here's Coach Connors. Uh, welcome to our eighth show with Absolute Empowerment, and we are greatly honored today to have as our guest former White House Deputy Press Secretary Hogan Gidley. Uh, Hogan, uh, so honored to have you on, us, on the show. Welcome. Coach, I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the time. I'm, I'm looking forward to the next little bit we can spend together. Well, I want to tell you first the objective of the show is we've kind of evolved into uh, locating people who have been incredibly successful and possess an even more incredible testimony of faith uh, that got them there. And so, you know, we we basically want to tell your story today. And uh, before we start, I will preface this by saying that we have uh, uh, a beloved common connection in Greenville with uh, Randy and Betsy Wynn. And uh, I was honored to, to be able to meet your dad. And, you know, I know that your father threw the first touchdown pass in Ficklin Stadium uh, when he was at Rose High School, which is incredible. And uh, also, I was very flattered that he bought my book and, uh, and told me how much he enjoyed it. And then when I went down to Fort Worth to a conference, uh, your folks took me out to a great barbecue place. And we had a real nice time and, uh, you know, very sorry when when I heard that your father got very sick and, and passed. But uh, uh, deepest in condolences there because he was a great man. And uh, so I really appreciated that. Well, I know he appreciated you and thanks for those comments. Uncle Rando talked about you all the time to dad and then dad got to know you and, and build a relationship. And, and after after games on Saturdays, he'd give me a call and say, well, you know, coach said this or coach said that, or, Hey, I know coach is going to be excited about this coming into the, yeah. the new week uh, for practice. And so he was always in tune with, uh, with what the pirates were doing. And we would watch games together, even distanced apart, uh, you know, I, I being in, in Washington or in South Carolina and just kind of call each other after plays and wonder what in the world happened. He said, I'll, I'll ask coach, I'll ask coach on when I get a chance <laughs> to talk to him on yeah. Sunday. So it was a, it was something that made him real happy. So I really do appreciate that. Well, you know, a strength coach can only provide so much insight, but I, you know, I try my best. Uh, so what I'd like to, to talk about is uh, starting when you were young, uh, you know, you, you've been so successful. I guess I'd like to talk about uh, where you established the fiber of the flag and the Bible in your heart initially and then kind of go from there. Sure. Um, my parents got divorced when I was really young. Uh, I was born um, in Gastonia, North Carolina. Um, they were together then, but uh, when I was uh, before I was I think I was a year old, um, we had uh, we moved to El Dorado, Arkansas. It's a little small town, middle of nowhere. Um, it's about two hours straight south of Little Rock, so 14 miles from the Louisiana border, right in the dead middle of the southern part of the state there. And uh, Grew up there with my mama and uh, got to see dad when he would come through town on business trips. And we went hunting every year. We had a, a trip at, in um, in um, uh, Thanksgiving where we go duck hunting in Arkansas. It's kind of a tradition we had. And we kept uh, all the way up until uh, he passed away. In fact, that was one of the last times I saw him was when we went on that trip. And, um, you know, I, I think early on uh, it was my mom who kind of who led the way for me in the spiritual front. Uh, she was a great example for me. And she was really on fire for the Lord when we were in El Dorado after that divorce and, and when I was kind of, uh, you know, getting into grade school. And and uh, I remember kind of in the fifth and sixth grade where she was just on fire and she would talk to me about uh, God and, and Christ. And, and I would wake up sometimes and she'd be sitting there telling me she's going to read the Bible passages to me and, you know, trying to wake me up for school. And, uh, you know, as, as a typical young person would, I slept through most of it. But I think, uh, you know, her persistence there is 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 consistent with what the Bible tells you is to bring your child up in the admonition of the Lord. And 
she sure did it. And uh, I, I remember, um, you know, I asked the Lord to, to come into my heart and, and he obviously pressed that upon me at a, at a young age. And so I think I think the Lord called me to himself, uh, you know, as a preteen. Uh, I got into a good Bible study group there in um, in El Dorado. And uh, we grew up in one denomination, which which uh, we felt over time had kind of veered from its stated purpose of adhering to the biblical tenets uh, of of the Holy Word and, and kind of moved into where some of my friends were at the time. As you know, there's so much good community with Christ and, and, and got sure. to really kind of learn and, and know Christ more at that level. But I would say once I moved to South Carolina um, back in 2004, Four is where I really caught fire myself. I sat under some really good teaching in a church there, um, and it was kind of a non-denominational church, but not, I wouldn't say it was a rock band non-denominational church. It was more puritanical in nature and, right. uh, you know, really focused on the Reformation and, and uh, you know, the teachings of, of Christ and did a good job kind of walking us through the Word and then using, you know, the the, the hermeneutics of, of using other scriptures to define uh, other scriptures and and kind of really shaped my beliefs and, and what God wanted for my life. And I think it was a, a really impactful uh, 15 years I spent in Columbia. And, um, you know, and, and I still listen to some of those old CDs I had from that church because they were just so important to me. And, and as a man, I think um, I, I needed a lot of uh, black and white. Um, there are so many issues out there that we can kind of color as gray. I needed someone to tell me, no, this is what the Bible says. Take it or leave it. It's not a buffet. Uh, you've got to take the whole thing. You got to. You can get some pizza every once in a while, but the Brussels sprouts are going to have to go down too. And <laughs> and so I think learning that from that particular yeah. pastor was um, was was very helpful for me. And I look forward to to the services every Sunday and, and Sunday night. I even went a few times too to to get that extra little bit in when I was struggling. And I tell you, when you move to D.C., it is I would argue probably one of the most romantic cities in the world because it's it's a place where you, it's the seat of power. It affects not just people here in America, but the decisions here affect people all over the world. And, and I got to tell you, it's hard to kind of adhere to some of those Christian values when you have people all over this city trying to, trying to separate people from the word of God. But, you know, I, I think my faith was strong enough to where, uh, you know, you, you don't make mistakes uh, all the time, but I think God was there to kind of pick me back up when I did and say, no, no, let's, let's focus back on what I want for your life. And, just just an amazing time here in Washington, D.C. I wouldn't obviously be here without without the teachings of, of, of the Bible. I wouldn't be uh, where I am now without his his guiding hand and, and word on my life every single day. And and while I don't study as much as I should, I don't read as much as I should. I know that God is always there for me. And a lot of times in the White House, um, you know, I could I could we would always say the highs are really high and the lows are really low in that building. And a lot of times I'd be going through some tough stuff and I just kind of take a breath and say a little prayer to myself. And then I'd have the time to, 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 and the energy to push on through the rest of the day. And then, you know, I wouldn't go two, three days later, we'd be out on the road and someone would come up to me and just hold my hand and say, Oh, we love you so much for working for, for the president. I got to tell you, our prayer group prayed for you just the other day on Tuesday. And it was the day that I actually had that extra boost to get through the day. Yeah. So to see the to see the actual impact of those prayers and people would always say to me, what do I, what do we pray for for you? And I would always say wisdom, discernment and just strength to get through kind of the meat grinder of the day to day in that in that White House. And I could feel it. And so for me, it is it is central to my life, central to my decision making. And uh, while we all make mistakes and we all falter and we all fall, uh, Christ welcomes us back uh, when we ask for forgiveness and we repent and we try to do things the other way. But. Um, you know, I, I have to say in, in that White House and the decisions you have to make every single day, the you could feel the love of Christ. You could feel the word kind of giving you guidance. Um, and and I'll, I'll kind of end with this one anecdote. I remember at the beginning of uh, COVID, it was a really difficult time. It was a, a virus that was unforeseen, unprecedented, um, uh, unknown coming straight from China. And we were da meeting down in the Situation Room. And if, if no one knows out there listening, if you never heard the term Situation Room, it is a place inside yeah. the White House that is quite important. It's where you go to, to make serious calls about serious matters all over the globe. And we were down there and the president hadn't come down yet, but the vice president was sitting at the head of the table. And I was at the table with 
you know, generals and, and people from the Department of Defense and the, Pen uh, the Pentagon actually the building. And then we had uh, people from the health, um, the health organizations too, trying to get a grapple on this. And before we started, uh, Mike Pence kind of looked around the room and he said, you know, I think it's important here uh, right now before we have this meeting to kind of start with a word of prayer. And he looked around the room and he saw me, he said, Hogan, you're, you're, you're a man of faith. You love the Lord. Why don't you open us up in prayer? And that was very humbling to me. And, and of course, before I said the prayer, I had to say another quick prayer. So I'd have the power to say the prayer and give me some words and knowledge because, you know, I'm in the room with all these important, incredible people. And they're calling on me to open up, um, you know, with some words of wisdom from Christ. And so I, I leaned on that best I could and, and said that prayer. But it was important for me to realize that administration, the president, the vice president, they were really focused on getting things done for the American people. But they knew there was a higher power that needed to guide them. So. Right times like that where we really leaned on God to me were really important. And how many times that, that we had black pastors come in and put their hands all over the president, pray for him and pray over him, pray over the building. It, it, it's just something that was a common thread throughout the, uh, the administration that I think really made it uh, more successful than anyone thought possible. Well, very interesting. That's, a long, an that's a long answer, but I, I'm, I'm I, hey, I appreciate the you sharing the information. That's what we're here for to tell your story. Um, so what was your discipline of study uh, through college? And, you know, basically, what were the steps getting you to the White House? Well, I would imagine some people may click and turn this off. I was actually a news reporter and a news anchor. I even did some weather on the weekends uh, in my early uh, days after college. It was broadcast journalism for me. I wanted to do that. And had a plan of how I want to make it big and do all the things you need to do to get on television in the big time stations like New York or somewhere like that. But God had a different plan for me. And when I started looking around at what to do, um, you know, there was a man who was in office in Arkansas that I really admired and really liked. And something told me to reach out to them. It was a man named Mike Huckabee, uh, who was governor of the yeah. state. His daughter is about to be governor of the state as well. He's a former pastor, a preacher in the Southern part of Arkansas. And, he was just someone that really taught me you don't have to jettison your Christian beliefs to be in politics. In fact, you use them together to come up with the solutions for the people that ask for things. And, um, you know, when I got out of school, I, I, I popped around a few stations, did some TV in, in, in different markets. Little Rock is kind of where I finished my TV career. And um, and and I ended up talking to the governor's office, said, hey, guys, you know, you got a re-election coming up. How can I help? And they said, well, you know, we got some folks here to do some media, but they're mostly t uh, newspaper people. You're a TV person. You, you think you could help our shop a little bit, kind of, you know, get ready for the reelection campaign. I said, absolutely. So I went to work for him. It's been a 21, 22 year relationship at this point. And uh, I met Sarah Sanders when she was 19. So I've been really close with that family for a long time. In fact, I just flew out to Nashville and did Governor Huckabee's show on TBN. He's an amazing man. He was a good mentor for me, still a close friend. And we always had just such tender moments together, but we had a lot of fun on that campaign trail. That kind of got me to where um, I wanted to do politics more. And so when I left the governor's office, I moved to South Carolina, did a lot of races out there, became the um, chair, uh, no, excuse me, the executive director of the South Carolina Republican Party. And in 2008, we had two huge presidential debates, one in Columbia, South Carolina, and one in Myrtle Beach. And that was the time when all of a sudden you could have like 10 or 15 people running for president. In fact, Mike Huckabee actually ran for president that year. It was a big year. Uh, Republicans kind of got washed out, though, because it was Obama's big push that year. Yeah. But um, got to get my feet wet with politics more and more and more and, and, and kind of own a couple of projects and do certain things, do some national television. And the next thing you know, uh, it was it was time to, to go back on the campaign trail. And when you live in a state like South Carolina, Everyone comes through there because it's an early primary state. So you get to see all the candidates early on. It's Iowa, New Hampshire, and South Carolina, as everyone knows. And I kicked the tires of a lot of candidates. But there was one guy that kind of stood out to me. It was a guy named Rick Santorum, a senator from Pennsylvania. He ended up finishing second in that race to um, Mitt Romney. We won, I think, 13 states, 11 states. But his faith guided him. He was Catholic and, and someone that, that uh, I appreciated. We had some some good trips around the country talking and, and uh, he's, he's a fun guy. But it was someone that I, I realized at that point in my career, I didn't have to kind of, you know, sacrifice any of my morals or convictions to go work for somebody. I could pick someone I really felt like the Lord wanted me to work with. And that was Rick. And 
we had a great, we still have a great relationship too. And when, when all that got done, uh, I kind of went back to South Carolina doing some different things. Huckabee ran again, I think in 2016, I was on that campaign. It was short lived, but yeah. of course, Sarah went into the white house and ended up working for president Trump. And when she became the press secretary, Sarah was the one who called me back up and said, Hey, Hogan, I need someone to come up here who's got my back, who's got the president's back, who can work on behalf of the country, who knows the game of politics, but also understands communications. We need some good people like that up here. Would you consider moving to D.C.? And I said, absolutely. And she said, look, we can't pay you that much. Here's the I said, look, this isn't about payment. This is about really trying to do something good for the American people, for the future of the country. She said, you know, you and I both kind of had the same attitude about this job. It's it's service. So let's see what we can do together. And I said, great. I, I, I came up here with the idea I was going to be here for three years, but God has had me here for five coming up in five days, October 17th, uh, somewhere around there. I'm not sure when this is going to air, but, but uh, you know, I will have been here five years. And so I'm, I'm struggling with God right now to tell him he needs to get, I need to get out of here and move back South. But right now I'm kind of stuck in the swamp. But that's kind of how I got there. And, and, you know, I stayed in the the White House longer than Sarah did. She left after uh, a little bit after I got there and and was there for a long time. And then the president asked me about six months to go to go to the campaign and be the press secretary there. And so I went to the campaign to to kind of finish out strong. And uh, it's been a a blessing. But uh, definitely I'm still tired from the time in the White House. There's no job like it. Um, The the intensity of it, the. the pressure you feel every single day is is something right. that I've never felt before. And I, I was speaking with a reporter just the other day and I kind of said, look, I don't know what it is about me, but I'm still tired. Like I have residual leftover exhaustion from the White House. And the person kind of looked at me and goes, every staffer I've talked to from that administration has told me they feel the same way. So that is not different. So then I felt good. I didn't feel like I was kind of weird. I felt like I was normal. <laughs> as as being in yeah. line with the other folks. So it's been a it's been a fun time, but that's how I got over to the White House. Well I can relate because I felt about the same way after about 32 years of collegiate strength coaching, you know, 12 hour days sure. and seven days a week a lot a lot of the years. Uh but uh you know I really want to get into the seven principles of Judeo Christian ethic and talk a little bit about those because I think it's very important and and, uh, you know, because I get confused sometimes uh, about our country, about uh, what 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 is the platform for for each party. And, uh, you know, and I, I don't know if, uh, if we're going to continue with two parties or you know, they're so diametrically opposed right now. It's hard for me to 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 understand the same thing sometimes. But, uh, uh, you know, more on social values originating in the Old and New Testament. And, uh, you know, so we're talking about the Declaration of Independence, Constitution, Bill of Rights, so forth, what it's, so forth, what it's based upon. And, uh, and you know, you can look at the uh, American Patriots Bible. And, you know, that, that first Jude- Judeo-Christian ethic is dignity of human life. And so, you know, if you look at you shall love your neighbor as yourself, Matthew 22, 39, you shall not murder, Exodus 20, 13. You know what? We haven't done a very good job of this, you know, uh, in our country. I mean, uh, it just seems like human beings continue to slaughter each other. And, uh, yeah, uh, you know, it's I, I just want to know what, what what are your thoughts there and what how can we move forward and make our country better in that respect as far as dignity of human life is concerned? Yeah. And look, I think we do it in a lot of ways. I mean, there, there are murders and killings every single day in this country. It, crime has spiked. It's gone through the roof. The, the rapes are up. The burglaries are up. Assaults, murders. But also, you know, since Roe v. Wade, 60 plus million babies being murdered in this country as well. Um, it's a it's a it's a real problem. And if you go back and look biblically, God isn't too kind to the, to the nations that continue to, to slaughter and, and disobey his commandments. No question about it. But I think, I think the answer is pretty clear. And I think anyone that comes on this show probably has the same answer. It's just a return to that Judeo Christian ethic. It's a return to understanding what God wants for our lives. And that's to respect other people. You know, our constitution's clear too. If we're going to get away from, well, I would argue the constitution is, is a biblical document, but it's not the Bible, of course, but the right to life, liberty, life is the first one. Um, they put it there for a reason because it's one of the most fundamental cornerstones of where we need to be as a nation. And we are a nation of life. Okay. Yeah. When people get trapped in a well, 
when the building collapses in Florida, we expect to find people alive. The whole country pauses. And whether you're a Christian or not, you're thinking about it. You want them to find people alive in the rubble. It, it, it's almost like our, our nation rallies to the principle, the, the, the fundamental of life. And so it's odd that so often people in this country just kind of jettison that thought process in the political sphere as it relates to abortion, but also, you know, um, the, the, the po politics of not enforcing the law. So we've seen a lot of that lately. It's not just the spike in crime that, that, that uh, is problematic. It's the refusal to prosecute those who commit the crimes that just breeds more animus and breeds more uh, crime. And so, look, it's just a return to biblical values. We've got to have that because people have to understand the importance and sanctity of life. And even if you're not a Christian, people fundamentally understand that other people's lives are important and that it is something that is special. And so we just got to do a better job talking about the importance of that fundamental right and how we can uh, better prop it up to get people to understand um, the significance of, of every single breath and every single heartbeat. Well, I just believe we got to find somebody to lift up every day. You know, when I, when yeah. I wake up in the morning, that's got to be my first thought. Who am I going to lift up today? You know, and not be focused in on me. Yeah. And uh, that's that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, it is such a self. You're right. It is such a selfish culture and country. And so for those of us uh, are around America who, who have the ability to sacrifice and focus on other people, I often have been told, you know, when you're feeling down or you're upset, do something for somebody else because it takes the your mind off of your own issues and you focus on other people. It's always a good place to be. I just think we need more people like you out there, coach talking about these issues and trying to get people off of the self-centered belief system and to focus on their, their fellow man uh, and yeah. how they can better facilitate making their lives better. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do a lot to, to change this country and the mentality. Well, coaching is one of the most egocentric professions that you can get yourself involved in. So what I'm trying to do is lose myself to gain the kingdom. And, uh, you know, because when you're coaching, it's, it's all about you because you're trying to keep a job somehow right. or, or you have to market yourself in some, you know, across the country if you lose a job, you know, so it's, uh, um, it's a tough deal. But I, I wanted to mention to you that I was a police officer in South Florida uh, back wow. in the early 80s. I worked steady midnight shift. I got out of school. There weren't many jobs. I had one of my degrees was in criminal justice. I ended up in South Florida interviewing uh, for a job in Delray Beach, Florida. Uh, I think they interviewed 140 of us and hired seven. So I was lucky to be hired. But uh, uh, I had I got involved in the Florida State Police Olympics and won some powerlifting uh, contests. And so they took me off the road and put me, you know, made me the fitness director for the department. But then my captain kept wanting me back on the road because I was, uh, I still had some speed then. And I could, I was, they had me chasing people a lot on that midnight shift. Yeah. Uh, but you know, what I wanted to mention is, is just defunding the police. You know, it, I've been there. Okay. And I wouldn't give anything for my experience. My experience was incredible just to see what goes on in a town every day, every night. And, uh, it was very eye opening to me, but when we did drug busts and things like that and confiscated anything of value, then that money would go back to the department. And I just remember where we were in dire need of new vehicles and we got all new vehicles and that made a big difference you know, of course, generated enthusiasm with the department as well. Uh, but um, <laughs> I did not see brutality then. I mean, I, and we had guys that were running our department that would not put up with that at all. I mean, you were, you know, you were going to be called on the carpet. You're going to be in deep trouble if if something like that occurred. So uh, I yeah. enjoyed working in the short time there that I worked, but just to have an understanding of how important it is to fund the police is, I, you know, I don't think you can have a true understanding of that unless you get out on the street 
And if you want to go ride with somebody, you, know, you might be able to find somebody to ride with uh, to get an idea of what it's like out there. But the, the number of police officers now that are being killed in this country is is mind blowing to me. Yep. Uh, so as a citizen, as a voter, I'll just give you my opinion there. And as a former police officer. Well, look, thank you for, for that service. The folks out there on the front lines uh, who, who serve in in law enforcement to me have always been kind of fascinating. I could never be a cop because I'm afraid I'd shoot everybody I pulled over because I'd just be too nervous that someone was going to kind of attack me for whatever reason. And and you guys have to you know kind of diffuse situations, calm things down, and you also have to make arrests and you also have to yeah. chase people, as you said, when you had speed. But the whole mentality of the left who's been pushing this dangerous defund the police movement now for a while is insane. And I remember I kind of got into an argument with a reporter one time on television when they were saying, oh, no, no, you know, Joe Biden and, and, and the people on the left, they didn't say defund. They said uh, redirect funds. And I kind of laughed and said, you know, if you don't think redirect is the same thing as defund, then let me redirect your paycheck into my bank account. Everyone knows what redirect funds means. And you guys are already strapped. You don't have the resources you need to do the job the way uh, you know you want to do it. You do an outstanding job on the front lines protecting people in these communities. But remember, the Biden uh, campaign and Kamala Harris were pushing for for money fundraising for uh, criminals who caused all the death and destruction, two billion dollars worth of damage during the summer of love across this country. Not for those who actually lost their businesses or their livelihoods, but for the people who destroyed the businesses, trying to get them out of jail. The whole thing is upside down. And now we're seeing, you know, when, when Trump gave his State of the Union speech and talked about funding the police, Democrats sat on their hands and didn't stand up, wouldn't clap. And then Biden gets in office and then they said something about defund the police, defund the police. And then when he finally gave a, a joint uh, session to Congress a speech, he said something about funding the police and Democrats stood up and started cheering. And I was like, wait a minute, no one's buying that because you guys let the country burn. Not to mention it was during COVID and you didn't have to wear a mask and it was fine to be together to, to protest. So I think that people understand that's a real problem out there. It's a number, it's a top two, top three issue, depending on where you are. But the fact is something I didn't realize when I took over uh, press in the white house was policies actually matter. They impact people's lives. And right now we have people in uh, positions of power who put in policies that really make our communities dangerous. And we're seeing, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, spikes in crime all over this country. And communities just aren't safe anymore. And it's because of the policies that that uh, they put in place that were short-sighted, uh, that were completely deranged, that were dumb. And now they're just flat out dangerous because people aren't out there. You're seeing a massive blue exodus as people begin to retire early because they don't want any part of it. They're not getting any support from their from their chiefs or their captains because of because of uh, the backlash the chief or captain will receive from people on the left. So it's it's a big problem. But I do think the American people are waking up and saying, "Oh, wait a minute. I understand there may be a police officer out there too who do things that are wrong. They need to be dealt with and and taken off the force." But everybody else is out there to protect and serve, and they're doing that and have been doing that for a long time. We need to fund them. We need to protect them because Lord knows they go out every day and protect us. Right. Well, when you're rolling on the ground somewhere, you know, two o'clock in the morning with somebody in a remote place and you're looking for some backup, I mean, uh, that's not a good feeling. Okay. Right. So I've, I've been there and done that. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had some backup. Can't imagine. Uh, so, but uh, moving to our second, uh, our second uh, Judeo-Christian ethic, the traditional monogamous family, uh, uh, Genesis 2, 23 and 24. And Adam said, this is now the bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. <clears throat> she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And so uh, <clears throat> the guy that wrote the Bible, I guess, uh, put this thing together. Uh, basically, his quote was a holy union between one man and woman. And, and, and out of that union comes children. And basically, the preserving the traditional family is vital to the future of any great nation. But, you know, I mean, hey, 
uh, are we still adhering to this as a nation? Is this, you know, I mean, it's, yeah. it's very confusing right now. <clears throat> it really is. And of course the government has come along and disincentivized family. Um, there's an attack on the, the family unit. Of course, anyone who wants to get married and have a child, um, is a radical, is a crazy person. You know, you should stay in some thankless job making widgets or entering things into spreadsheets. You shouldn't worry about families. E everywhere you turn, um, there's just a, a, an assault on the, the core family unit. I mean, groups like uh, BLM, groups like Antifa on their website say it's the destruction of the nuclear family is their goal. Uh, it's on their website. So it's a, it's a clear stated mission. And I think people are starting to wake up to that. I mean, the, the babies um, being born out of wedlock in the African-American community is somewhere around 80 uh, percent in the white community. It's gone up close to 50 percent as well. Um, bad, bad statistics and bad numbers. And even liberal leftist think tanks tell you you have to do a few things to stay out of poverty. And it's get a high school diploma, um, get married and have children after you're married. You do a couple of those things and the left of the left will admit That'll keep you out of poverty for the most part. And uh, we're seeing an exact opposite of that. I would argue, you know, policies of the past, as I mentioned, how much policy matters to the American people in their lives. We need to start propping up families more and uh, understanding that, that this country needs to survive. I mean, our, our replacement rate for children is is uh, upside down right now. Uh, we're, we're not going to be able to, to keep the country alive uh, if we don't start having more children. And, and of course, the ideal way would be in a nuclear family. Um, but but that's obviously an issue that I think uh, is, is so significant and fundamental for the Bible that we've kind of turned our back on. And, and I would argue in some corners, the traditional family is mocked and scorned. But thankfully, uh, if if it's a sad thing to say, but if COVID gave us kind of one silver lining, it's the involvement now of parents into their children's lives more than they ever have been. You saw that with the teaching of critical race theory. You've seen that now with the transing of the kids, you know, trying to let let teachers and, and uh, doctors keep secrets from children and their parents uh, with children from their parents, which is unacceptable. And so I, I think we really have seen kind of a reversal in some of that, a rejection of some of that. And I'm praying that we see a return to that Judeo-Christian ethic of, of strong families. Hey, I'm just an old coach trying to find my way to heaven somehow. And I'm, I'm just trying to understand uh, where this country's at right now with regard to uh, what we believe and, uh, and how important these biblical principles are in our country still. And so number three is the national work ethic. And of course, uh, you know, we can look at uh, Thessalonians 3.10 there. For even when we were with you, we commanded you this. If anyone will not work, neither shall he eat. Yeah. Uh, this country recovered from a, the Great Depression. Uh, but right now, you got a lot of business owners, particularly with restaurants and so forth, that can't find workers. That's right. a big problem. And I'll just tell you this. I grew up in Western Pennsylvania and all my family were coal miners. Uh, sure. My grandfathers combined put 100 years in the coal mine and they mm. started at age 12. My maternal grandfather had one vacation. He was a machine gunner in World War One and got mustard gassed over there and went right back home into the mine. So I grew up Democrat. And, you know, we... I just feel like the Democratic Party was a lot different than, uh, and I, hey, I'm not a politician, man. I don't, I don't know, uh, but I grew up not having a great affinity for people with money. Right. Now, I'll be honest with you. Before I even went anywhere in the country, I had no idea that there were so many people in the United States who were so wealthy. You know, right. <laughs> it blew I know. my mind when I got out, I got out of Western PA. And, and looked around the country a little bit. And, uh, but you know, it's, uh, you know, things have changed, uh, you know, but I, I still consider myself a blue collar guy. Sure. Uh, but in, in, in the meantime, I'm losing 200 grand right now on my 401k for some reason. Hmm. 
And I'm not too happy with that. And so, uh, you know, I think yeah. that national work ethic is very important. And yeah. uh, you know, I don't know where we're going from here. Uh, we're going to have this midterm election, whatever, but I'm, I'm really hoping that things change soon with the stock market. And I guess they always do, but I don't know if you can always count on that, you know? Yeah. Um, and I don't either. Sorry, I was getting a call there. Um, look, I think the work ethic piece is, is it, it's, it's not here like it was either. I mean, what, what your, your grandparents and parents went through, what you went through, what I came up in. Um, look, there's a reason these restaurant owners don't have workers because the workers are getting paid more to stay at home and not work than they would be if they went into work. Now, that's a bad policy, as I said, because that impacts people's lives. But the trickle down effect for everyone else is bad, too. But also someone's got to pay for that. So we all have to work to allow other people to stay home. So it sets up a weird dichotomy, not to mention the fact that the people who are staying home and getting a paycheck higher, bigger than they would be if they're going into work. How do you fault them for it? Yeah, you say, well, get out there and work. Yeah, they should be working, but if I'm going to pay you more to stay home than I am for you to go into work, I would say a lot of people would go, all right, well, you know what? I'm just going to stay home and make the money. Why would you yeah. go uh, Why would you go for, for something higher if you're getting paid more to stay home? So I think that's a big problem. Uh, look, I think, um, you know, the, the blue collar aspect of what you're talking about, I work for a blue collar Republican, Mike Huckabee, someone that began to see a shift and grapple with a nation that was kind of turning away from the, the old uh, blue dog Democrats yeah. to the Republican Party. Then Rick Santorum comes along, another fellow uh, Pennsylvanian, and, and the same type of mentality, wrote a book about it, Blue Collar Conservative. And then Trump comes along, who's a billionaire, and says, you know what? I, I hear you. No one else has been listening to you. I'm going to focus on the workers in this country. I'm going to focus on getting you jobs that are good paying. I'm going to focus on getting manufacturing back in this country. I'm going to focus on getting you wage increases for the first time in 30 years and lowering your taxes. He did all of those things. So not only only in Washington, D.C., would it be a anomaly? Would it be weird for a politician to promise something and then actually do it? Donald Trump actually did it, which is very important, of course. But it also affects people's lives in a good way. And so I think a lot of folks that were in your um, with your background kind of sat up and said, you know what? Um, I think there is a party out there speaking for me. I think there is a party out there trying to protect me. Um, yeah. and, and right now it's the folks on the right. I mean, you know, shame on them if they let go of this golden opportunity to pass laws and, and put uh, policies in place that really do impact our workers in a positive way. But right now, I think a lot of folks who are in your in the shoes of your parents and grandparents are standing up and listening to the to the folks on the right, because it's the folks on the right who are listening to them. You know, yeah. I often point out the fact that under the Trump administration, the, the, the media didn't get him. The left didn't get him. It's because they don't get you. They don't understand you and they don't understand the struggles you've gone through. He's a billionaire. OK, he doesn't have to worry about money like you or I do. But not only is that a problem, but now when you see high gas prices, the administration isn't saying the Biden administration isn't saying, hey, you know what? We need to make more energy to bring down prices. They're yeah. begging other countries to do it. And if you say, look, I feel some pain out here. Remember, Bill Clinton, I feel your pain. Yeah. That Democrat Party has gone. Now they're saying, no, no, you don't feel pain. That's not real. I don't know what you're talking about. There's no pain. There's no problem. Also, you should go buy a $70,000 electric car. That's the problem. You're not buying the expensive car. It, it's almost like you're in the wrong for feeling pain from their policies. So I think there's a real upside down nature here to the argument that the left is trying to make. And it's why it's not resonating. I mean, the, the issues that are facing this country, inflation, obviously, cost of living going through the roof, crime, energy dependence on foreign nations now. And by the way, if this were Vladimir Putin's fault, wouldn't that be the reason to make our own energy so we wouldn't have to rely on him? And by the way, we're also going to get energy because we need it. We can't run this country on gumdrops and Skittles and unicorn hair. We actually need energy. And so Biden's going to other countries who produce it more expensively and dirtier than we do. So we're getting the energy one way or the other. The question is, do we make it here at home for cheap and for clean? Yeah. Or do we go get it somewhere else? And so 
I think people understand it's a real problem. I know it's a long answer to a work question, but I think people out there who are working hard um, like you and unlike the people listening to this podcast understand, you know, when you work more for less and inflation, your wages may have gone up, but inflation has outpaced the growth of your wages. So you've actually seen a decrease in your take home pay. Oh, yeah. You look around and go, why did that happen? How did that happen? It's because the policies from D.C. are absolutely strangling American families. They know it because the left is in charge of every branch of government, the House, the Senate and the White House. And so they're the ones who are to blame here. And it's going to be a, a, a real kind of reckoning, I think, in November. OK. Uh, number four, the right to a God centered education and uh, Ephesians 6, 4. And you fathers do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them in training and admonition and Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And also uh, Harvard's original seal, 1636, truth for Christ and the church. I'm going to assume that might not be there now, but I don't know. Uh, but how do you feel about that with regard to the platform that you are promoting? Yeah, look, I think um, education has always been something in this country that's kind of been a political football. But what you've seen now is what the left is doing with this critical race theory and, and, and taking God out of schools. It's been a slippery slope. And you look around and all of a sudden now they're teaching, you know, that that you if you if you feel like a, a girl today we should call you a girl or if you feel like a boy today we should call you a boy we should change your name and by the way let's not tell your parents about it let's just keep this between us so the left is kind of pushing some of these things and i love the fact that when the left does something and they push critical race theory in school for example we recognize and go hey quit 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 teaching my child that that, that america's evil that we're the cause of the world's problems we're not we're the greatest force for good for strength of mercy all over the world. And we say, quit teaching critical race theory. And the left goes, no, no, we're not teaching it. Also, it's very important that we teach it. Wait, what? It, it doesn't make any sense. Again, COVID kind of gave us a peek behind the curtain. And what the left hates, regardless of the issue, critical race theory, elections, um, uh, transing your kids, it's all about transparency that they don't want you to see what they're doing. They've been indoctrinating kids for a long time and all types of crazy theory and thought. They're continuing to do it now. Only now it's being exposed. You see a, a great Twitter follow, Libs of TikTok. They basically take posts from leftist teachers and put them online. There's no commentary. There's no look at this crazy person. It's here's what the left is doing. Here's what they're saying. And they're behind the scenes videos of, of teachers telling you how they're getting kids to come out to them. Uh, whether being gay or lesbian or wanting to uh, mutilate their bodies through transgenderism. And they want to keep that secret from the child's parents. And so I think uh, an embrace of the Christian Judeo uh, Judeo Christian values, as we're talking about is the theme of this show. You start to do that. You respect not just other people. We talked about that in the, the killing part of it, but you respect yourself more and what God created. It's all an effort to supplant God. So God made me as a man. Well, I don't like that. That's a mistake. I want to be a woman. So call me a woman. I'm now a woman. I'm going to mutilate my body. It's almost like you're trying to supplant what God wants in your life. You're trying to be God. And obviously that that's the road to ruin for sure. So I think there are a lot of things out there. There are real children out there who are really struggling with some of this stuff. And I think what they yeah. need is good counsel. Uh, they need, uh, you know, some 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 conversations with others who've gone through it. But just to 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 say things, I mean, even people on the left, like Bill Maher, pointing out that this stuff seems to be pretty regional. It, it's in some major city centers. That's a cultural issue. That's not a, these people aren't really transgender. They're doing it because other people in their classes are doing or their teachers are telling them to do it. That's Bill Maher, not me. That's someone on the left pointing this out. So I think there's going to be a rejection of this coming up pretty soon. Um, and, and that's important because you need our schools to be bastions. Of, of education. It needs to be unbiased. Teach the good, the bad, um, the ugly of our past. But there's a reason, you know, nations like Cuba are, are, are walking through the streets, holding American flags, chanting the words liberty and freedom, because they know what so many on the left don't, that this country is the greatest idea ever realized, offering opportunities you would never get anywhere on the planet, which is something I'll probably talk about a little bit later. 
But that's what education in this country should afford you instead of trying to, to talk about how this country is inherently evil and the cause of, of so many problems around the globe. Well, number five, the uh, Abrahamic covenant, uh, Genesis 12, 13, I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Uh, the covenant states that if a person or nation obeys God, observing the moral truths found in the Bible, that the person or nation will be blessed. And then also uh, uh, God would bless Abraham with generations of children that would outnumber the stars in the heavens, Genesis 15, 5. So, uh, you know, that's pretty strong. Uh, and really that's, that's what my podcast is all about that right there. So, uh, any thoughts there? Yeah. And, and what's interesting about the scriptures you just point out, it's not that he just gives it to you. He's asking you, you got to come to me. You, you come to me and bless me. I'm going to bless you in return. Okay. And it may be not all the blessings we want. As I said, it was a blessing to move to DC. I'd love to move out, but he's keeping me here and I'm counting it as a blessing. I promise, even though it's harder some days than others. But that's the type of conversation, um, you know, you, you or, or I would say that's the kind of communication the Lord gives us. It's pretty clear. It's pretty cut and dried. And one of the things we did in the, in the Trump administration, of course, was was uh, keep that thread of, of Christianity through all the things we did. Not to mention the fact blessing um, Israel, um, making sure that we move the embassy to Jerusalem, uh, recognizing uh, the reality on the ground in that place, uh, dealing with the Golan Heights in the way we did as well. And so that to me is important because there's a large segment of the left who, who continues to uh, attack the Jewish people. Um, and, and that's obviously uh, interesting as it relates to where the Bible stands on that, too. But, but look, I think I think understanding that God wants you to glorify him and, and God wants you to praise him. Uh, do that and he will bless you beyond measure in ways you never thought possible. Bless you, yes, with children, as the scripture says, uh, and generations through Abraham, but so many other ways in which God will provide for you when times are toughest. And so for me, those scriptures always ring true and uh, they're important, uh, you know, I guess, guidelines for how we should live our lives and how we should have a relationship, a personal one with Christ yeah. uh, and, and with God. Well, uh, you know, I've been through a melanoma I was, I survived seven head coaches in my career, kept a steady paycheck. Uh, I survived four days of being in intensive care and cardiac uh, unit. And uh, there's no question in my mind, and I have no idea why God continued to bless me, but I know that I have been a blessed man and uh, I've been extremely fortunate and I am extremely thankful and so uh, I'm, yeah, I'm going to stand on that. Uh, Good. Number six, common decency. Uh, Matthew twenty two thirty nine. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, you know we want to do the decent, right, and honest thing, such as uh, feeding the poor, for, for for example. But I have a personal, a very deep personal experience here and i you know i'm just wondering if you, you might even be able to help me with this through all your contacts but i have someone extremely close to me my daughter uh who suffered and became afflicted at the age of 17 with schizophrenia mm -hmm. and uh we had to hospitalize her a dozen times uh we had to tie her down um uh, she envisioned that she saw people drowning in the in a pond in the back of my house, which didn't happen. She was perfectly normal until then. Uh, when she was younger, uh, she did suffer on a construction site, a very hard hit to the head with a board. Hmm. Um, I don't know if it was a four by four or whatever, but she was very disoriented for almost a week. So we don't know if that had something to do with it. But bottom line is my daughter gets $700 a month and she has 
she's on medication, of course, and we went through many medications before we found the right one that worked. And thank God we found one, but it also made her gain 100 pounds. Right. So when you gain 100 pounds and when you are disabled, you know, it's hard for you to function normally. You don't have a whole lot of friends. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I have talked to a lot of people about this, about, you know, because when I'm gone, what's she going to do with $700 a month and, and a, a handful of food stamps? Right. And so when you look at that and when you look at, okay, what, why was this guy going down the street here in Los Angeles or whatever, stabbing people? Was it because he has a mental illness that's legitimate and he's getting paid $700 a month? And after a certain period of time, he doesn't have a family to help him, for instance. What's right. going to happen? And uh, I don't know if you know anybody who can help me, but I'll fly wherever you need me to fly to get that help. You know? Sure. Um, we can talk about that offline for sure. Um, yeah. Look, I, I don't even know what to say. That's a that's a really horrible story. My heart just breaks for you and your family, for her. And um, if there's any way I can help, I absolutely will try. But well, I really but, appreciate um, it. I do think I do think there is there are some serious mental illnesses in this country that need to be addressed and need to be dealt with. Trump talked about it all the time. There used to be um, facilities open for that. They've closed them all down because the stigma got so bad. They just kind of started letting people out. Some people needed, um, you know, special care. Yeah. Uh, you see people up and down, walking up and down the street here in D.C., just, you know, clearly with mental illness, mental anguish, right. and they don't get the help they need. And so I think that's a serious problem that a lot of politicians try to address. It's been tough uh, because there are so many people advocating on both sides of what they should do. But uh, it's real. And, and I think yeah. it's something that, that that people talk about, but but some more needs to be done. Well, I really appreciate that. And maybe we could talk a little further about that. But uh, she's doing well now. And I'm good. I'm, it's great. I'm so thankful that she's doing well and uh, she she actually helps my parents a few days a week and i'm very thankful to still okay. have them of course uh but sure. uh you know the last one that i'll talk about as far as uh, uh these ethics is our personal accountability to god and uh as hebrews 9 27 as it is uh, appointed for men to die once but after this the judgment and every person and nation will one day give an account for their actions to Almighty God. So uh, a very important one there. And uh, what are your thoughts there? Look, I think uh, the Bible obviously pretty clear on this as well. Um, and uh, the personal accountability in our society and in our culture is basically kind of mocked and laughed at at this point. Um, sadly, uh, we need right. to do a better job of of uh, being accountable uh, to our fellow man, um, yeah. but, but most assuredly to God. Uh, there are a lot of people in this country, in this culture that tell you, do what you want to do. If it feels good, do it. There is no ramification. There is no fallout. If you want to burn down cities, it's fine. If you want to stab someone, we're not going to arrest you. If you want to do drugs and sell drugs, hey, we'll let you out of prison. The accountability for things that are obvious crimes has really I don't want to say gone down. It's it's basically non-existent. We've got to fix that. And uh, yeah. there are ways in which we can do that um, through getting people in positions of power who understand the importance of accountability, judges in the uh, judiciary, and also, uh, you know, uh, prosecutors uh, in that branch of government that take people who do acts of violence, that do commit crimes, and actually punish them for doing it. We don't need fewer people in prison. We need more people in prison. Those who commit crimes should, in fact, uh, be punished. If that, of course, means a jail sentence, put them in jail. I'm just saying right. so often, um, uh, you know, th these people are just let out uh, back into the streets. And then how many times have we seen somebody in the last little bit who's committed a crime? But that person shouldn't be on the streets because they've committed multiple crimes heading into that in, into that particular um, instance. And so. It's the repeat offenders. Um, and, and we have a whole political party on the left who refuses to deport people who are here illegally and unlawfully. Forget the fact they broke the law coming into this country. But after they've had DUIs, after they've had um, child molestation, after they've had rape, after they've had murder, 
They don't send them back home. They leave them out. And those crimes, for example, we have our own. It's going to sound kind of weird. We have our own killers right. and our own rapists here. They need to be held to account. But you don't import more and allow yeah. them to stay in our country. And so I think it's just a total mental change on how we need to do things to try and uh, uh, empower and embolden um, those in the judiciary, give them protection and cover to do the right thing. And when someone commits a crime, punish them accordingly. Yeah. Got you. Uh, well, I just have a few more questions and uh, comments. Uh, you know, I've coached, I don't know, three or 4,000 athletes at the collegiate level. 80% of the young men I coach were African-American. Uh, one of my podcasts here recently, three pirate pastors. So three of the African-American men that I coached are now pastors. Uh, I love these men dearly. And on my Armored Life team, I have a website, armoredlife.org, uh, an oasis for the troubled athlete. Mm -hmm. I have a team of about 15 men, uh, many of which are pastors or former NFL athletes. And so uh, when I speak to these men who are pastors, of course, they strongly believe in biblical principle. Sure. But as far as their vote goes, uh, I can't even keep up with over the, th the years, all the things that Trump's been hit with and accused of. And I mean, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm you, totally you and me, bo you and you me both. And I had to defend them all. But what they will say to me is coach, we believe in biblical principle but we are not going to vote against anybody who is a racist portrayed as a racist. And so in their minds, of course, of course, some of them believe that Trump has been portrayed as a racist in many ways. And so uh, I know that this is something that you've battled. Sure. And, uh, and I've, I've heard you try to talk about uh, what Trump has done for the African-American community and you had a hard time every time I've saw, seen you getting three words in. So I just want to give you an opportunity now to address that. Well, look, I think that was one of the focus uh, focused issues that we, we tried to make sure we did uh, in the White House. And, and Donald Trump was the leader of that. I mean, look, we had higher employment for African-Americans under Donald Trump than we have at any other time in our nation's history. Uh, we had opportunity zones where we partnered with private businesses to invest in inner cities. And when we saw an increase in wages across this country, um, the higher percentage of wage increase was in the inner cities and the opportunity zones around 8% uh, more uh, amongst the African-American community. Uh, not to mention the platinum plan, working with those uh, pastors at the local level as well. Look, I, I think in politics, it's kind of typical where you have the right that refuses to really engage with the African-American communities because they don't feel like they're going to vote for them anyway. And the left who thinks they're going to get the African-American vote, whether they do anything for them or not. So they just ignore them. They're kind of, they can be marginalized sometimes politically, but the president went out and said, no, we're going to do criminal justice reform. For example, we're going to work with these communities to, to improve their lives. And thankfully what we were able to do is, is put policies in place that really, really helped American families, regardless of race, religion, color, or creed. Something Donald Trump has done, uh, you know, his whole career, for heaven's sakes, even as a billionaire. I mean, this guy was celebrated by uh, by rappers, one of the most mentioned rapper uh, names in, in rap songs for decades. Um, um, you know, I mean, the thought that that uh, that that Donald Trump has any animus to anybody uh, much less people in the, in the African-American community, is something that the media has manufactured. It's not true. It's not there. You know, and you go back and, and, and look, I got into a big argument on, on TV about this with, um, with CNN, and I was like, they always try to portray him that way, but that's not who he is. They just take little snippets and try and tar him with something. And, and that's always been frustrating for me because they called, uh, jo uh, they called John McCain a racist. They called George W. Bush a racist. It's their default. Whenever the right begins to make inroads into the African-American community, the left has to try and beat them back by calling them names. It doesn't matter that all the policies we're putting in place actually helps people's lives 
in the African American community. And so when you take a look back at, at Joe Biden's career, it's, it's someone who said he didn't want his children growing up in a racial jungle. It's, uh, you know, someone who, uh, who, who praised, um, you know, a, a person from the U.S. Senate who was, a, uh, uh, was in the KKK, um, was an exalted cyclops in the KKK, and, and, and Joe Biden speaks at his funeral and praised him. It was, it was Joe Biden who received an award named after George Wallace, the famous segregationist from Alabama. So, you know, give me a break here. Uh, if we're talking about people who've really gone historically to to stand up and protect the rights of the African-American community, it's always been Republicans. Go back and look at, at Abraham Lincoln, for heaven's sakes. All those people are Republicans. Those who, who fought to get the Civil Rights Act passed, all Republicans. Those who filibustered it, all Democrats. It's actually knowing some of your history here. And the left, with their megaphone in the mainstream media, has done a good job saying, no, no, no. All the problems you face, all the racism is all from the right, when in fact, it's historically and up until including today, the left that has done everything it could to hurt the African-American community, to keep them down, to not vote for the for the bills that would have, um, you know, given them certain rights they didn't have before. It's always the left. So Donald Trump is going to take a backseat to no one and take a lecture from no one on the left on this topic. He's done everything he could to his power in his four short years in the White House to improve um, situations for every single community. He's done spe things specifically targeted to the African-American community. Yes, he's done things specifically targeted uh, to just about every community. But his policies writ large improve people's lives. And that's unassailable. So regardless of what the left says, regardless of what the media says, all they want is political power. All we were trying to do is make people's lives better. And I think we did that. Well, we've got two parties right now that are diametrically opposed, it seems to me. And then there's also a division within the parties to some extent. But how do you see the future of the two party system? Do you Look, think I don't think it's going to change I don't think it's going at some point? Yeah, I don't I don't think it's going anywhere for a while. Go back and think about someone like Jesse Ventura, for example, ran as an independent in Minnesota, won as governor. Yeah. And that's great. You say, well, that's a third party. That's good. Right. But when you get elected, you have no constituency. You've got no allies because you're not with the left and you're not with the right. So the way right. the thing is structured right now, I think, you know, it's flawed, but it's a two party system because yeah. inevitably what the voters will want to see, too, is kind of a an easy checklist of where people are. So if you have a D by your name, they know you're for these things. If you have an R by your name, you know there are these things. Having to learn a third party as a voter is probably going to be a little bit too much to ask for a lot of people, sure. at least at this point. We saw Ross Perot kind of be a spoiler back in the 90s and the George H.W. Uh, Bush days. He was an independent, picked up a lot of votes there. Um, Ralph Nader, the Green Party, has done a lot of things. But right now, uh, these two parties uh, are, are kind of our choices. And remember, that's what elections are. You may not like the two choices you have, but elections are, are binary things. You have to yep. pick one or the other and uh, do everything you can to get out and vote because that matters to your life. And I think people see that when they go to the pump every single day and what bad policies do. Well, I despise racism coming from anywhere, any side, because I just think it further divides us. And that, that's oh, all sure. it's for. Uh, but uh, I wanted to ask you, who do you consider the most effective legislator and why? Um, at the, <clears throat> you know, you our to system <laughs> is set up to move really slowly. It's yeah. just set up to be slow. Um, yeah. I think anybody out there who can give a good message and sell it to the American people and then work with others to get it done, yeah. um, you know, find policy positions that 70, 60, 80 percent of the people support and try and rally people to your side. It's hard for people on the right, I would argue, harder than the people on the left, because the left inherently has um, the, the, all the levers of power, the big tech, Hollywood, uh, the media, colleges and universities. And of course, they control all the, the, the three letter, four letter agencies here in Washington, D.C., too. So it's always inherently more difficult for the right. So yeah. I don't know if there's any one person I find more effective than the other. Uh, they're all trying to make ends meet in that building uh, in, in the Capitol because, uh, you know, the, the headwinds against everybody 
for the most part on the right is, is, is way stronger. Remember, Donald Trump had 93% negative news coverage, still was able to accomplish so many things. No yep. one else could have done that. So uh, I, I give Donald Trump some, some, some kind of a hat tip here as being someone who could legislate, even though he was in the executive branch. But there are some good messengers, I think, on both sides trying to do good things. But for the most part, the left has gone so far radical that their embrace of ideology uh, over actual policy that would improve people's lives is problematic for them. Whereas the right, um, you know, uh, has a tough time working together all the time to get things done. But any yeah. one person, I, I don't know, they're, they're all kind of uh, gotcha. fighting their own, fighting within their own party and then also fighting the external forces as well. I could ask you a lot more questions about Trump, but this is about you. <laughs> so right. um, where, where would you like to see yourself in five years? Um, I'm not sure uh, if, if the White House uh, is taken back in 2024, potentially back there. I'm still so tired. I kind of I kind of look down the street and see the building and I kind of shudder sometimes. But look, I, I just think the opportunities afforded here are, are opportunities you can't get anywhere else uh, yeah. in the world. I mentioned that before. And. You know, I talked about where I grew up and I was raised by a single woman, had a wonderful relationship with my father, of course, a great relationship with my stepmother as well um, and, and all my family. But look, you know, I, I was I was someone who, you know, the first lady calls and says she wants me to come travel the country with her and, and open and give her, you know, open with a speech to get her on stage. And Ivanka Trump, the president's daughter, calls me and says, hey, I need you to come do some some town halls on me. You sit on stage with me. We did one in North Carolina, did a couple in North Carolina, actually. Yeah. And that doesn't happen anywhere else. I, I don't have a last name. I, I love my last name, but I don't have a last name that is steeped in political power. I'm not a Kennedy. You know, I'm not a, I'm not an Obama. I'm not a Clinton with years and years and years of service um, out there. I'm not a Gore. Um, you know, I'm a nobody from nowhere. And, and to be able to walk, down the street, I, mean, I shouldn't even be able to, you know, smell the grass clippings at the White House, much less walk down the street, go through that front gate, show my badge, give a hat tip to the Secret Service, walk down the world famous colonnade, go into my office and then walk 60 paces into the Oval Office, stand in front of the Resolute Desk and give the president advice. Now, he never took it. But still, I got to do it and I wouldn't and I wouldn't get to do it anywhere else on the planet. But right here yeah. in America. And, I, I, you know, I've, I've been on Air Force One hundreds of times. I've been on Marine One with the president, the helicopter. I've been in the beast, the Cadillac he rides in. I'm not saying that to say, look at me. I'm saying that because anybody in this country has the ability to succeed that, that you're not afforded in other places. And and, and I'll, I'll kind of end with this. I think God speaks to us in a lot of different ways. Um, but I don't remember the years exactly, but 1918, there was a, a Spanish flu, a, a global pandemic that wiped out a lot of folks in the late twenties, 29, you had a great depression in the sixties, civil rights, uh, unrest, and there were crimes all over the country and, and, and people fighting each other. And then, um, you know, in 74, I think it was 74, we impeached the president and Nixon, those four things global shifting occurrences that happened over the span of like 80 plus years, a global pandemic, a depression, civil unrest, and an impeachment all happened in 2020. Mm. In one year, all four yeah. of those things happened. If wow. that isn't God trying to, you know, jerk a knot in you and say, wake up guys, you need to be involved. And when you're a Republican, you gravitate toward the constitution as your document because it kind of gives you the right to be left alone. Just leave me alone. That's all I want is really to be left alone. You can appreciate this as a coach. Someone once said, the people who want to win the game are always going to defeat those who just want to be left alone. So yeah. my advice is get involved. Regardless of how discouraged you may be, get involved at the local level. The more local the government, the easier it is to effectuate change. Do that. Because you can you can you can really impact the future for not just generations that are related to you, but generations all over the globe. Because what we do in this country really does a lot of times trickle up from the local level. That's where it's important. That's where the battle can be won. And I would encourage anyone um, you know, to get on your knees and ask God where he wants you to be. 
ask God where he wants you to be most uh, most empowered and most impactful, because I talk to a lot of preachers out there doing the stuff I'm doing with like election integrity and other things in this country. And preachers will tell me sometimes they feel a little convicted because there are only two thirds pastors. God ordained the church. No question about it. God ordained the family, but he also ordained the state. And a lot of these pastors out there have come to me and said, look, I've been so focused on the church. I've been so focused on family and those are important. But God kind of has been tugging at my heart saying you need to focus on the state because that's where a lot of these decisions get made that impact your lives. And if you're not in, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So be thinking right. about that. And I think that's important, important, uh, important messaging from from the folks I've been talking to across this country. Well, sir, you are an incredibly accomplished young man, and I really appreciate your insight today. And uh, I just feel very honored to have been able to to have this conversation with you. I, I, I'm hoping I can stay in touch with you. And uh, of course, you know, I'm I, I'm always looking for greatly accomplished people to bring on this podcast. That's the whole and Christian people to bring on this podcast. Uh, I will tell you this: if if you can get me Ainsley to talk about her books, <laughs> we will be my Hogan's hero. <laughs> I understand. I can try. I know Ainsley well. She's from South Carolina also, so I can I can text her. We, so, we, we talk all the time. Uh, I appreciate that. And uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, and, uh, Coach. God I'm, bless. I'm appreciate sure it. Randy and Betsy are tuned in. I hope so. <laughs> thanks, Coach. Okay, take care. Bye. Uh, this is Jeff Connors signing off with Absolute Empowerment and ArmoredLife.org. God bless and uh, listen to us next week. Thanks a lot. You've been listening to Absolute Empowerment with Coach Jeff Connors on the Sports Objective. Join us every Monday night for a new edition of the show. Listen to the show pretty much everywhere podcasts are found. Be sure to follow us on social media at the Sports OBJ on Twitter and TikTok, at the Sports Objective on Instagram. Like and follow our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel. As always, we appreciate you listening to the show, and go Pirates!